everyone. Thank you for attending uh, what was entitled Memo from Your Blog's Legal Department. Um, I believe I was asked to uh, speak about this because I conducted a presentation for writers um, a few years ago at the 412 conference, sponsor conducted by Lee Goodkin, the former professor at Pitt. And someone who saw that thought it might be worthwhile for me to speak with bloggers. My name is Chris Hall, and I am a lawyer, but I am not your lawyer. <laughs> and what we're going to do today is we're going to discuss issues and concepts and questions that, in my judgment, anyone who has a blog and also owns anything and wishes to keep it should keep in mind when they're tapping. Okay? We're not going to provide answers that you can rely on. We need an answer to a specific question about a particular situation. You need to talk to a lawyer who A, has agreed to represent you, B, is familiar with all the facts and circumstances underlying your situation, and C, ideally knows what the hell he or she is doing. Okay. Um, to prepare for this, I read a number of blogs around town and was surprised enough by what I saw and also what I didn't see that I've revised from my original um, outline to move away from what I would consider the more serious stuff because it's, uh, I didn't find as many serious blogs in town as I expected to. I found a lot of um, other blogs. So we're not going to spend as much time as I initially planned on things like access to public documents and um, uh, reporters' shield laws and those sort of things, because when you're writing about mashing up a banana for your baby's breakfast, you probably aren't going to be as interested in the shield laws and um, Freedom of Information Act requests. If anybody wants to talk about those things, I'll be happy to talk about them afterward. Um, in fact, I'll be eager to do it because what I learned from reading these blogs in the last few weeks is I wish there were more of them that were serious because Pittsburgh needs them. Um, before I went to law school, I was a reporter and an editor at the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette and the Pittsburgh Press and a newspaper in Texas, and I still strongly support not only expression, but also the freedom of expression and the rights of people who wish to express themselves in our society. The Pennsylvania Constitution, I believe, had bloggers in mind when it noted a couple of hundred years ago that Pennsylvanians may freely speak, write, and print on any subject. And so like much of the rest of our law, expression is protected in many ways, much expression by our <coughs> laws. And that's a good thing for bloggers because my hunch is very few of you have an active functioning legal department. Okay? Um, and so the law is on your side and gives you a head start in many ways, particularly with respect to defamation actions and things of that sort. But there are a number of ways that a blogger can cause legal problems for himself or for others. And my hope is today in the space of about 45 minutes, we're going to identify some of the issues and some of the questions so that you can decide whether you need to look into something more carefully or maybe even get some advice. Again, always premised on the point that I assume you own something and want to keep it. If you don't, if you are a full-blown anarchist, I'm wasting your time. <laughs> but if you own anything, house, car, hat that you would like to keep, some of these things um, it might make sense to pay attention to. Because when you write or when you speak, you can do wonderful things. You can change the world. That's what I thought when I went into journalism, and that's why I quit newspapers, because I love journalism and therefore disliked newspapers. <laughs> but um, you also, in addition to being able to help people and do wonderful things, you can hurt people. And that's something I learned when I was editor of the Pitt News, and I hadn't thought about this before. But when you're publishing, and in, with a blog, 
your range of publication greatly exceeds what we did at the Pitt News with 16,000 copies five days a week. Um, but I learned in college that you can hurt people when you write, even when you're well-intentioned, and that other people aren't going to see things necessarily from the same perspective from which you view them. So it may come as a surprise to you. And when you put things in tangible forms of expression and they're lasting, okay, learning that someone is totally upset and is looking perhaps to come after you is the wrong time to recognize that you probably should have done something a little differently. Um, and so the first thing I would encourage all of you to do if you're going to continue to blog is to find a good lawyer. Now, lawyers mostly charge by the hour and it starts in the low hundreds and it goes as high as six, seven, eight hundred dollars an hour. I therefore recommend that you find a good lawyer who is willing to work for you without charge or at very low charge. You want to find someone with a good heart, therefore, and also good judgment. Because even though you're not going to ideally be paying much for this advice, you still want it to be good advice. Okay. And the way you do that is find someone who believes in what you're doing or is a personal friend or is, you know, related to your spouse or something of that sort, who's willing to do it just primarily out of the goodness of heart. But you probably want to pay some attention to keeping that person interested so they're there when you really need them. And so I'd recommend that you compensate them with things like meals, tickets to sporting events, <laughs> compliments. Rolling Stones albums are always nice. You can do things for people that don't cost much, but go a long way in inclining them to stick with you. And if you learn anything today, this is probably the most important practical point. Okay? When you get a summons in the mail, or someone calls and starts screaming about how they're going to sue you, is not the time to go looking for a lawyer unless you desire to pay $600 an hour for a lawyer. And then, again, knock yourself out. But if you want to find someone who's going to help you in that situation without charging you tens of thousands of dollars, you want to line that up ahead of time. Okay? <clears throat> I think it's worthwhile for everybody in this room, if you blog and intend to continue to blog, to consider that. I recognize that not everybody knows lawyers or um, uh, likes lawyers or wants to be anywhere near lawyers. But this is one circumstance in which you want to have somebody ready in your pocket in case you have a serious question, in case somebody does sue you, in case someone does threaten you or send you a demand for a retraction or send you a demand that you take something down from your website. If you wait until that moment to try to find a lawyer, you will be sad and you will be poor. Okay? So find a lawyer who's a good person who will help you at low or no charge. And again, you know, when you get two pit tickets, think about that person. Tell them how great they are. You know, whatever, whatever you're comfortable with. Um, but try to keep that person on your side. Um, but even if you have that lawyer, unless you are broadcasting or publishing pure PAP, Someone, someday, is going to dislike what they read or what they hear from you. And you want to prepare for that way, not only by having this lawyer you're going to take advantage of, but also <laughs> by thinking before you publish. There are many circumstances in what you publish, in which what you publish, could anger people. In some of those circumstances, it could give them cause to chase you for damages or to prevent you from continuing to blog um, or from just making your life miserable one way or another. You know, people always ask lawyers, can he sue me? Can she sue me? That's the easiest question you can ever answer a lawyer because the question, the answer is always yes. We live in a free society, okay? About the only way someone can't sue you is if somehow you've been able to arrange to get a judge to issue an injunction or an order forbidding that person to sue you. 
Okay, the likelihood of that happening is about the same as the likelihood that I'm going to be struck by lightning before I complete this sentence. It might happen ten times a year in the whole United States. Okay, so yes, people can sue you. The better questions are, can they win? And even if they don't win, what are the consequences going to be for you? Okay, so I think it's ideal to think about what you're doing not to eliminate all risk. You cannot insulate yourself against all risk unless you print pure PAP, okay? But you can learn to identify particularly risky circumstances to avoid unnecessary or undesirable or unreasonable risks, okay? And also to think about, is there a better way to do this in which I can convey the message I intend without painting a huge target on my chest, okay? And that is always worthwhile. Now, my sense is that the law and bloggers had a great relationship until a few years ago because they essentially ignored each other. But those days have ended, okay? And you can get in all sorts of trouble with your blog, sometimes regardless of the content. You can get in trouble, for example, most bloggers believe they're immune from the regular commercial laws and taxes of our world, and they're not, okay? If you have some relationship that provides compensation to you, free goods, free tickets, payment, and you blog about a service or a product from the people who compensated you, you are a paid pitch man. And believe it or not, the Federal Communications, or the Federal Trade Commission has started to look at that and has issued guidelines about when someone must disclose that compensation has been provided in association with content, okay? So if you get a review copy of something for free, that's great, but you're now being paid. If you get free tickets, let's say they give you two tickets to something for you and two for you can give away to readers, you need to disclose that, especially if you're writing about the event because you're considered a paid marketer. So you. You don't want to misrepresent objectivity. You don't want to say, I'm not saying nice things about this event because they're paying me. If you got free tickets, they're paying you, okay? So you don't want to misrepresent objectivity. You want to disclose any compensation. If you're writing a nice review about a camera and they gave you a free camera as a review copy, disclose it, okay? You also want to distinguish your editorial content from any advertisements. So far as I know, no one has been prosecuted, let alone required to pay anything or uh, subject to an injunction because of this, but it's coming. And the, the rules are already out there. You can find them on the federal government website, and you need to pay attention to that. So there's something you can get into trouble with regardless of what you publish. Second, if you would, pardon me? Uh, just a quick question about review copies. I mean, it's a, review copies for books have been going out to you know, newspaper uh, editors, etc., and uh, journalists and reviewers for years and years and years. Has that always been the case that that's considered compensation and they're paid pitchmen? Because no, because I believe my sense is that it was always understood that if it was in the New York Times review of books that the publisher had provided a copy because it was standard. In blogs, it's a little bit different because a lot of bloggers aren't um, acting. Um, as part of the traditional media and have different <coughs> relationships. I suppose that's the big question, though, is where's the line drawn between traditional and The line on blogs is if you get something for free and you blog about it and you don't disclose that, you're going to be considered to be engaged in improper conduct by the federal government. And you think even a book? Yes. And a review of a book? Yes. Because? Because it's not natural that the reader would understand that you got a free copy because you're not associated with a publication that it has I for see. decades. We presume the New York Times did not buy the book. Most people don't know or don't care. If you work in newspapers, you understand that, yes. And most readers, yes. That would be a common practice with the newspapers, though. But in a situation where, say, um, Dell sends you a new netbook that they want you to try out, or Canon sends you a new camera, you have it for three weeks and then you send it back. As long as you put somewhere in your blog something along the lines of, Dell sent me this to see what I thought, here are my thoughts. Right. 
you're covered? Or I'm a commercial prostitute and I take free things. I mean, you can say it a lot of ways. <laughs> I think okay. yours is more colorful. Um, <laughs> well, thank you. Um, but the more straight you are, the more you disclose to your readers, the better off everybody is and the better legal protection you have. And if you have some, you know, if you drive a car for a year and give it back, that's, that's providing a substantial value to you. The fact you eventually give it back doesn't necessarily mean that you didn't receive something of value. Even going to an event for free is probably a provision of a thing of value. You can also get in trouble because you are a business, if you accept any compensation, including ads like the Google ad service <coughs> for any for your site regardless of whether it's tied to any content you are a business you are a for-profit business even if you don't make a profit because you spend more on computers and 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 research and that <coughs> sort of thing you're still a business and businesses need business privilege taxes and they need to file tax returns or I'm sorry business privilege licenses in many municipalities, you need a business privilege license. In Philadelphia right now, they're conducting coffee houses and, and, and happy hours for bloggers because the city of Philadelphia's position is if you make eight cents on a Google blog ad one time, you are a business that requires a $300 business privilege tax. And why bloggers need to pay attention to this is that the risk of detection is so high. You want people to read your stuff, so they're going to find it if they're intent on looking for it. And it's not going to be very hard for government agencies to figure out who you are. Okay? Your ISP will roll over in a heartbeat if the district attorney comes looking for you. Okay? And so you're going to be easy to find. You're an easy mark. And um, so you need to consider whether you have to file tax returns, whether you need to pay taxes, whether you need licenses or permits. And my practical judgment is that the threshold you should consider, is it really worth, unless you have 40,000 visitors a day or a week, is it really worthwhile to sign up and see, well, you know, I get 15 unique visitors a day. I'll bet Google would, uh, would make me rich. Is it really worth it to set up with Google Ads if you're not sure you're going to make a decent profit. Um, and I, again, I don't think many people think about that. They just see the Google Ad yes or no and they think, well, what could, what could go wrong? Well, you could owe hundreds or thousands of dollars in business privilege taxes and um, income taxes and all sorts of things. So again, consider that before you start because you're not, you're not under the radar anymore. Philadelphia is coming very hard at bloggers. Yes. I have a question. Um, if you are in a community that has a biz business privilege tax, and this is something outside of your regular business, would you be then? If, is it the jurisdiction that you live in? Where would you be? Where would that come after you? Remember when I told you that a lawyer who yeah. liked you? That's the kind of question. That's okay. It. Yes. Fantastic. Okay. Um, in general, though, it's where you're blogging, where your where your home base. If you're a business, where your business office would be. Um, but it just as long as you think about these things, you're going to be ahead of most people. Um, you also may even at some point want to consider forming a limited liability entity, a corporation, an LLC, an LLP, something of that sort. Again, you want to talk to a lawyer about the specifics, but I think most people are going to find that a corporation is the reflex, but it's not the way to go. You want to form something called an LLC, a limited liability company. And for a blog that either makes a decent income or engages in blogging about topics that are fairly risky or likely to attract objections, it might be worth it at some point to look into forming some sort of limited liability entity. Um, you also want to be concerned, and now we're getting into content, about intellectual property, yours and other people's. Okay? In general, there is some two words that you should all love, fair use, and that entitles you to Comment about something that someone else has written or said or depicted in an image. And to use some of that person's words, even though they may be protected by copyright or they might be a trademark, okay, without fear that they can sue you for copyright violation. Fair use is not a black and white subject. It's always gray. How much did you use? What was the nature of the original publication? What was your purpose for using it? In general, if you're just going to use headlines and brief excerpts, you're fine. If you start sending out complete 
uh, word for word copy and paste of Post Gazette or New York Times articles, you could have a problem. There's a newspaper now called the Las Vegas Review Sun that has set up a legal subsidiary essentially that scans the internet for any use of its content, which is hilarious because if you read it, they use other people's stuff all the time. And they send out these nasty gram letters and complaints to anybody who has linked. And they'll do it if you use 10 words. Because again, fair use is a judgment call. And then they expect you, or they ask you, do you want to go to the mat in court with us or do you want to send us a few thousand dollars and be done with it? Okay, it's just what the, what the music companies did, although the music companies were very heavy handed when they were dealing with LimeWire and Napster and the other file sharing services, which in the end were systematic, unlawful copyright violations. Okay, taking someone else's content without compensating them or without <coughs> their permission. Um, so fair use, yes. Is there some kind of digital action? There is. Paperwork you can do to protect yourself? Four minutes down the road. Right. Um, linking to images is a particular area of concern because it's hard to paraphrase a photograph or a drawing. <coughs> and I've seen blogs all over town taking Post Gazette, Trib, New York Times, Time Magazine, Huffington Post photos and just grabbing them and putting them up. Just got to rename before you put it back up. Pardon me? Just got to rename the photo before you put it back up if you don't want anybody else to find it. I believe <laughs> there is software actually that, that can recognize it, it yes. now. Okay. So, you want to be careful in particular about images. Unless you have a direct, express, and properly written license from the owner of that image to use it, there's always going to be some risk. Now, many people like people to reproduce what they did, okay? And practically, there are many circumstances in which it's not going to be a problem. The person may thank you, even if you're, but even if you're using what they called inline linking, which is not grabbing the photograph, putting it on your hard drive, and then uploading it from there. Even if you're just using one of these devices that allows you to use the URL of the, of the image to have it appear on your website, you could have a problem with someone, particularly someone who is cranky and owns that image. Um, so inline linking is safer than grabbing it, although then your problem is broken links. But inline grabbing is safer, but it's not a complete insulation against trouble. Thumbnailing, though, gives you even greater protection. If you don't use the entire photograph, if you use a relatively small and standardized size for photographs to give a glimpse of what you're attempting to, to, to convey or to encourage people to travel to the original site, okay, there's much, there's, there's more protection. I think it's technologically more time consuming and more difficult and it might not accomplish what you're trying to accomplish. But thumbnailing is another way to try to um, reduce your exposure to problems. There's also something called the Digital Copyright Management Act. If you put a notice on your site telling people that you uh, care about intellectual property and that if someone objects to anything that is on your site that could constitute a copyright violation, there's a safe harbor in the law if, so long as you tell people how to object and respond promptly to any claim of copyright, you might be able to uh, avoid a lawsuit from someone who's either interested in punishing you and just making your life miserable by causing you to spend money, time, and effort on a lawsuit, um, or somebody who um, genuinely is so upset about what you've published that they're going to chase you no matter, no matter what. Um, there's even a, a provision in the DCMA that if someone improperly causes you to remove something by claiming falsely that there's, a, or without basis, that there's a copyright violation, you can then turn around and chase them for having your rights to express yourself infringed improperly. So look into having a DCMA notice on your on your site, yes. What is, that stands for what again? Digital, Digital Copyright Management Act, I believe. If you just if you search for DCMA notice, you'll you'll find it easily. Government content, by the way, is not protected, um, so you don't have to worry about that. Facts and ideas 
can't be protected. It's just the way in which they are expressed. Um, you might want to consider looking at something called the Creative Commons, not only for dealing with other people's content, but also with managing your rights, because every time you express something in tangible form, you hold the copyright to it. And you may become concerned sometime by how people are attempting to commercially exploit your content or change it in ways that you don't think are appropriate. Um, so you may want to look into your terms of use of what sorts of rights you claim to your copyrights. The, st the legal default is all rights reserved. But you might want people to link to your site. You might want people to um, show other people a chart you've made or something of that sort. So I recommend that you at least spend a little time looking at the Creative Commons site so that first you're familiar with what the rules are if you see a Creative Commons notice on somebody else's site, but also to decide whether you want to employ Creative Commons licenses on your site. There also have been claims about something called deep linking, which is that many places or many sites like newspapers, magazines, want people to go to their home page because that's where the ads for the Lexuses and the Mercedes and Tiffany's are, okay? And they um, attempt to derive value from those advertisements and they don't want you linking to the four step down actual article or image because then you don't see any of the ads that ostensibly are being used to pay the photographer or the reporter who developed the content. Um, so be a little careful about that. It's a little tough because, you know, you send somebody to the New York Times homepage, God help them trying to find the image that you thought made sense to pluck off there six months ago. Um, but be aware of the issues about deep linking. Yes? Is, is some government content owned by, I mean, or not usable? Uh, I know the FBI sent Wikipedia yeah, letter. Yeah, bomb secrets are uh, probably... I guess the FBI sent a Wikipedia letter recently that went public that was like, you can't have our seal on the Wikipedia page yes. about the FBI. And people are still laughing about it. I wouldn't worry much about that. Okay. Once. I assume that they have lawyers that... What, the FBI? Yeah. Yes. Not but enough. Not good ones. <laughs> not enough to get that done. Um, well, WikiLeaks is another whole issue. God bless WikiLeaks. Um, you also have to worry a little bit about trademark law. For example, if you want to uh, uh, criticize a law firm or a business, you might have to use its name, okay? And some people, again, who are just looking to shut you up, will claim, well, you use the words Reed Smith or you use the words Deloitte and Touche, we're going to come after you for trademark violation. Those are people who, A, aren't familiar with American law and B would probably be happier in a more repressive authoritarian society than they are in the United States. So you don't have to worry much about those folks, but do remember that trademark law is designed to avoid confusion. And if you're creating a genuine sense of confusion about who authorized this or who's speaking or does the company, the sporting goods company we're writing about or the beverage manufacturer we're writing about might actually have some involvement and might be making this statement, be very careful because they are entitled to protect their trademarks against confusion. Um, you also want to consider comments as a very special area about intellectual property because comments are copyrighted the moment that they're depicted in tangible form and the copyright is not owned by the blog, the copyright is owned by the commenter. Okay, And that creates some very counterintuitive interesting, maybe even fascinating, but dangerous circumstances. For example, it could cause problems if you modify or delete a comment, because remember, you're now working with something that has a copyright protection, but you, don't, you aren't the copyright holder, okay? Um, and so you may want terms of service disclosed <coughs> on your site that will alert people to the fact that you can modify, delete, revive comments at any time you like, and that if they don't like that, they can go comment somewhere else, okay? But the commenter holds the copyright on the comment, and someone could object, especially if you modify the meaning. Um, that's probably, that's a legitimate concern by a commenter, okay? Um, you also probably want to include a license in your terms of service that you can reproduce or reuse comments or anything of that sort if there's any chance you're going to do that. Now, generally in our law, a republisher of something that's defamatory is just as responsible as the person who started 
the rumor or the claim. It, it has to be untrue to be defamatory, but usually if you republish something saying, well, she told me that first, I was just repeating it, is not a defense against defamation. However, with respect to blog comments, which, which is called third-party user content, um, the Communications Decency Act, another federal law, so bloggers are really uh, making it big. You're all over federal statutes and regulations. Um, provides a lot of very broad protection for bloggers with respect to what other people put up there with two big exceptions, violations of intellectual property and violations of federal law. But anything else, if you say someone is a jerk, um, you're not perceived to be the, 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 the publisher of that comment. You're just a passive conduit for someone else's expression and they're the ones answerable if something wrong was done. Um, so become familiar with the Communications Decency Act. It might take you three nights to read it, but it'll be worthwhile. Um, that was a joke. That's why you find the lawyer who's going to help you for an ice cream cone. Okay? <laughs> you also need to wonder, and by the way, I'm not that lawyer. <laughs> I already represent one blogger in town, and that's all I can handle. Okay? Um, defamation law. The law, as I said, protects expression and gives a lot of head starts to people who are expressing themselves, but defamation still exists. And not that it matters, but libel is written defamation and slander is spoken defamation. And if that ever becomes important to you, you won't give a damn because you're in enough trouble that you couldn't care what the definitions are. <laughs> we call it all defamation. Okay? And here's what defamation is. It is a false statement. Truth is an absolute defense. Truth, however, is expensive, difficult, and time-consuming to prove. Okay, I'm right may be very important, you know, from a 12-year-old's view of the world. Mm -hmm. But I'm right doesn't carry much weight when you're selling your house to pay the lawyers to prove you're right. Okay, so a lot of this is also practical consideration of risk versus reward. But it's a false statement that's unprivileged. For example, if you repeat something that is said on the witness stand at the county courthouse in a case of great public importance, it doesn't matter whether the underlying statement by the witness was true or false. You're reporting on a matter of public importance and you got it right, that witness did say it. And so that would be privileged even though it's false. So it has to be false, it has to be unprivileged. It has to be a statement of fact, okay? Opinions are protected, okay? You can call someone stupid, a jerk, mean. Incom all those sorts of things are protected, whether they're true or not, because in the end, those aren't facts. Those are opinions. Okay? There are actually still people who root for the pirates. That is an opinion. <laughs> they think the pirates are worth rooting for. Now, any rational person would say they're crazy. right? It's a fact. The pirates think. They always have. They always will. They're not always have to win. <laughs> well, the pirates have been hijacked. The pirates of today. The pirates run by the Nuttings and the Clatchies. But um, that's an opinion, and you can be on either side of the opinion and not worry about defamation exposure. It has to be fact. Okay? It ha must be published with fault. That means you have to either be negligent if you're talking about an average citizen or act with actual malice, which means you knew or should have known that what you were saying was going to hurt this person, be false, be unprivileged, if that person's a public figure. You can take much better shots, say, at Luke Ravenstahl, surprise, than you can at the average person, just somebody walking down Forbes Avenue during the middle of the day. Okay, You have greater leeway when dealing with matters of public opinion and people who are public figures. It also has to injure their reputation. If you if you write that someone is exceptionally lovely this morning, even if that's a damnable lie, they can't sue you because being called beautiful doesn't injure your reputation. There are four areas you really need to keep in mind and stay away from. Number one, accusing someone of criminal conduct. If you call someone a crook, a thief, a rapist, a murderer, you need to have a certified record of that criminal conviction in your pocket before you post that blog, that blog post. 
okay? You don't accuse people of criminal conduct unless they have been convicted and you can prove it. Number two, you can't accuse them of having a loathsome and communicable disease, okay? So all these, um, you know, Barack Obama has leprosy claims are out of bounds. Number three, it has a direct effect on their livelihood. And that's a little looser, but it's worth paying attention. If you're talking about something that could affect someone's ability to earn a living, you're at greater risk. And four, if you're writing about a female, you can't accuse her of being unchaste without running into trouble. And if you're writing about a male, you can't accuse that person of being impotent. Now you can talk about guys catting around all you want, and you can call women impotent, but you can't call a man impotent or a woman unchaste. Okay? And that would hold up all the way to the Supreme Court yes. to this day. All right. Okay. Um, Except for pretty cool. Right. <laughs> yes. I don't write them. I just report on them. <laughs> yes, sir. When you talk about accusing someone of criminal conduct, if you call someone corrupt, is corrupt a, is cor does corrupt mean criminal conduct, or does corrupt mean, well, is, is that... Is the definition of that more like, well, that's something he shouldn't have ought to have done? If you call someone a crook, that has been ruled in this country to constitute actionable allegation of, of criminal, of being a criminal. Okay. okay? Corrupt, you could fight about that all day long. But clear on the other side, calling someone a thief calling that person a robber, calling that person a burglar, calling that person a murderer, calling that person a um, rapist, okay? You better be, damn again, the only way, if you ever ask me about it, that I would tell you was it made sense to do it is if you show me a certified record of the criminal conviction, and then you can rock all night. Yes? And so the livelihood, you can't come back and sue for Pardon me? Like something that hurts the livelihood, you can come back and sue them for. It's easier because it's considered defamation per se. They yeah, don't have to prove any damages. Yeah, because one of my clients is actually losing business from a disgruntled former employee that's putting bad comments all over the web about him. He should probably get his lawyer several ice cream cones because that's going to be a big fight. Yeah. Okay. Many of these issues are are uh, not black and white issues, and when it comes to legal issues, if it's not black and white, it's expensive. It's expensive. Doesn't have to be great. It can be expensive, um, and so um, you know, think before it's two fifteen in the morning and you're really mad at what uh, Doug Shields or uh, Ed Rendell did. Re think hard, or maybe it's just some poor guy who got up at a microphone at a public meeting and said something stupid. Think real, or even if it's somebody who is a chiseler who is stealing from the government through the water and sewer <coughs> authority or the stadium authority or something like. that. Think very hard before you call that person a criminal in print. They may deserve it 100%, but they can still chase you and they can still make your life miserable. Does okay? using metaphor protect you? Probably not. Crook. That guy lost. That's akin to burglary. Um, yeah, uh, not the burglary's breaking and entering. It's, it's, well, it's more akin to, say, thief, theft. Okay. okay. Akin to theft doesn't protect you. Right. Whereas, I mean, if you say, He's a thief, or he's akin to a thief. He's acting like it. If you're, if you're even toying with that, <laughs> <'cause> <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> <right>. <laughs> okay. Because here's the thing: people who steal from the public have lots of money. They took seventy-five percent from every, seventy cents from everybody, so they have millions of dollars. Okay. Now, can you pose it as a question, like asking your audience, do you consider? What this was rule number one? Yes, you can always pose it as a question. The question is, are you going to get in trouble because of it? And you can't cloak what the average person is going to perceive as an assertion that someone is impotent or a thief or incompetent and it's his job by saying, well, I put a question mark on that, so I'm, I'm in the clear. Think what you're intending to say. Try to think about what a reasonable person would infer that you're attempting to say, because that's the standard that's going to apply in court. Okay? And be careful. <coughs> what do you do if you're sued? First, you regret that you didn't take my advice. 
<laughs> and you contact a lawyer immediately. Okay? In the world of litigation, 20 days goes like that, and you can lose a lot of rights in 20 days. Okay? You don't say, oh, I'm going to the Rush concert tonight, my sister's coming over tomorrow. You call a lawyer then. Ideally, someone who knows something about this. And you also might, in the, in, in, in the right circumstance, you might want to contact an adv advocacy group. There are folks out there like the very good people at the Electronic Frontier Foundation who, in a good circumstance, in the right circumstance, may help you. These are very smart people who know all about this, and they work for free. But only if they think they can use your case to change the law. Not that you were a good person and didn't understand that this was going to be a problem and it's going to cost, you know, you don't have the money. That's not a circumstance that's going to interest them. But if they think they can change the law or establish a precedent or advance the freedom of speech, they may take your case. Okay? So in the right circumstance, think about that. Although you really want to avoid that. Um, finally, two minutes left. Um, understand that another way you can get into trouble is to record audio in this state and in many states. You can record video in most circumstances. Lady ro ladies' rooms are off base, um, underneath an escalator. Probably want to be careful. But for example, if you are um, watching a public official come out of the house to figure out, you know, where whether he's going to a meeting with someone he shouldn't be having. Um, you can generally record things that are things that are public events, okay? Now you have to watch out about people using people's likenesses for commercial purposes and those sorts of things. But in general, you can record video. That's why television crews don't have to pack up when someone says, "I'm being indicted right now. I'd rather not be photographed." Okay? You can photograph them anyway, and you can record the video. <coughs> But you can't record audio without the consent of everybody in the room. And I, you know, I still represent the Pitt News, and I tell the, the reporters every year about this. And like clockwork, two of them come to me during the year and take out a uh, recorder and stick it on the desk and turn it on as if showing that to me is enough. And it's not. You have to obtain consent if you're going to record audio. Yes, sir. Does the video have to be signed? No. But if it's not, you've committed a felony. Okay. So it does have to be signed. It's a free country. You can do whatever you want, but they may put you in jail for it. They may take your house. Legally, you have to be, Without consent. Yeah. All right. Yes. I think we have about two minutes left. My normal rate, that is uh, 30 <laughs> some bucks. So, who wants to ask a question? I have a question. If yes. you get mad and you make a statement, is there a period of time that you can feel like. Good um, point. First of all, if you made a mistake, take it down. Okay? Number two, if someone asks you about a retraction, okay, that is always a serious inquiry. You need to talk to a supervisor, a lawyer. You need to take every request for a retac retraction seriously because a good retraction, a good retraction can eliminate or reduce greatly your liability. Even if you did wrong, if you retract it, you've helped yourself greatly. Okay? Never blow off a request for a retraction. Again, unless you're looking for trouble. Yes. Where would you post that that retraction occurred to do? If you well, there are two kinds of retractions. One is to just take it down. That's all somebody wants. Others are you say, look, I said that this that Thomas Wilson, um, who's running for Senate, was convicted of nine crimes. I've now learned who knew there's more than one Thomas Wilson, and this is not him. Okay, I had a when I, I represented Channel Four for a long time. Uh, I had a case just like that at Channel 4. Um, a, most people, if they're decent people and genuinely just upset because you now have made everyone, you know, call the police when they walk down the street because you put them, you put their picture up as the alleged rapist. Um, most people, if you retract, they're happy. The retraction should be 
of the same form and the same prominence. So if you call someone a pedophile on your front page in 72 point type and you issue the retraction and said, I was wrong, it was a parking ticket, not a pedophile. <laughs> and you put that in six point type, okay, nine clicks down, it's not going to work. It should be of similar form and prominence as what you're trying to back away from as fast as you can while you're doing this, okay? Any other questions? I'm not sure I understood you. If it's a public event, like for example, we record our worship services, we can record those and there's no problem with recording audio. Wouldn't public event. If you have the permission of the um, sponsor, the property owner, and you know, you walk sometimes into municipal um, hearing rooms or council chambers and there'll be a sign that says these proceedings are being recorded. Um, then, if you walk in there and it's and it's suitable notice, if, if it's if it's understand, you know, if the average person is going to see it and understand what it is, then yes, everyone is entitled to record the audio. But if, let's say, you own a convenience store and you are videotaping all of the transactions for for any one of a hundred reasons. You can't record the audio unless you disclose it or unless you get a written, well, unless you get a consent that will stand up from every person who's depicted. Such as a big sign on the door that says, if you enter into this building, you are consenting to. Right. Read the back of a Steelers ticket sometime. <laughs> okay? They can do anything they want to you for as long as they want to you. <laughs> as long as they don't kill you. <laughs> Good yes, I would say yes, because they have no expectation of privacy. But you don't act on that until you ask your lawyer. <laughs> Is there like an online uh, blogger resource with these kind of lawyer questions or law questions? Yes. The Electronic Frontier Foundation has a pretty good outline of this. Um, there are a lot of other ones out there. I'm not sure how reliable they are. But, it, but, but a good first start is the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Now, I'm willing to continue to ask or answer questions, but I will tell you that I believe we were scheduled to conclude about three or four minutes ago. So if you wish to leave, that's perfectly appropriate. If you wish to stay and ask questions, Bob Mayo, who worked with me at the Pit News, first guy out the door. First guy out the door. <laughs> Deadline. Yes. Um, if you wish to continue to talk, I'm happy to do it. Just stay safe, okay? Nobody's looking to get into trouble here. Think about what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you.